So the intent of this course is to really excite you about the remarkable things that are going on in sort of basic biological sciences uh, and also uh, in clinical uh, work, uh, disease related. And so the whole thing is an exercise in bridge building. And I trust that many of you, but perhaps not all, recognize this as the most famous bridge in the world, particularly if you grew up near New York City. This is the Brooklyn Bridge. And the reason why we use this as a logo for the course is for two reasons. One, it sort of exemplifies the challenge that people have if you're well-trained in basic, more reductionist uh, biology on one hand, or more in clinical translational kind of work on the other. The big challenge is to bridge the gap, in this sense, the East River, uh, to be able to communicate with one another. And that's one of the main purposes of this course. Uh, the other thing is that life is never the same on either side once you build a bridge. And so that's the intent. So we encourage you to uh, ask questions. If you don't follow what's going on, please don't hesitate to speak up. There will be questions after each speaker and also at the end, but you can interrupt if it goes. Now, uh, those who are speaking about more clinical related things, we urge them to avoid medical jargon and so forth. But if somebody lapses and uses terms that don't register with you, speak up. Everybody would like to uh, you know, do the right thing and uh, uh, communicate uh, uh, well. Now, when possible, and it's usually about half the sessions, uh, we begin with a live patient who has one PhD postdoc told me is the highlight of the course because it puts a human face on a disease. And so that individual briefly describes uh, what their disease is like, which is something that most people working in a laboratory have little communication with. And then there is uh, a, an individual, usually a physician or MD, PhD, for the most part working here at the clinical center, uh, who talks uh, in terms that are for a broad audience, uh, things like epidemiology, changing patterns of a disease, how people know if they have it, and things like that. It's not intended to inundate you with a medical student level kind of traditional lecture. And what the challenge is, what are the, what, what do we have, where are we? And then a basic scientist, who's also invariably, but not always from NIH, discusses not last week's seminar, but what do we understand in terms of basic mechanisms? And again, what are the challenges and where do these things come together? So I hope that you find this enjoyable and that you come to as many sessions as possible. Now, uh, I took the liberty of, if I don't mess this up, Okay, so one of the general themes that's bound to emerge this afternoon is that uh, the organisms, virus, bacteria, and so forth, uh, which are responsible for epidemics that pop up seemingly all the time, they're on one side of a fence and our ability to do something about it, recognize, treat, understand, and so forth, is the other. So this cartoon from a Dutch artist, do you recognize him, Dr. Mark? That's a Grook, an original Grook. <laughs> so this is the theme of the whole business. Problems worthy of attack prove their work by hitting back. And this is a good thing. So you might just give a little thought to what are all these things, all these uh, incredible name uh, agents, what do they have in common? Well, one of the things is they all come out of the tropical rainforest. And that's the deep reservoir of life, uh, contains most of the world's plants and animal species and viruses. And as you know, all living things contain viruses. Viruses can come from other sources, 
but it seems as if all the ones on that previous list somehow emerge from tropical rainforests. So maybe we'll hear something about how, why that happened. Bacteria, by and large, have a different source, and it's more complex than I indicated here. It even includes a school of thought, which at one point was voiced by Josh Lederberg, the Nobel laureate, that bacteria may actually have had their origin from outer space. So <clears throat> we're going to have two uh, extraordinary speakers uh, this afternoon. And I will briefly introduce them to you so we won't interrupt further. So first, uh, uh, Dr. Fauci, Tony Fauci, who is the director of NIAID, will speak. He's been the director here since 1984. Uh, his job is extraordinary. Uh, <clears throat> he oversees an, an extensive research portfolio dedicated to preventing, diagnosing, and treating infections and immune-mediated diseases, not only in this country, but around the world. In addition, Tony is the chief of the Laboratory of Immunoregulation, which has been responsible for many, many, many major discoveries, particularly in the HIV AIDS field. And he's probably, he's certainly one of the most cited scientists in that field. In addition, he's been an advisor uh, to the president, to the White House, to the Department of Health and Human Services on global issues, primarily be related uh, to AIDS, but also in relation to emerging infectious diseases, particularly Ebola and uh, influenza. Uh, I think if you were to ask the general public, uh, what do they know? or whom do they recognize at the NIH, uh, I suspect that Tony Fauci's name will be at the top of the list because of his very effective presentation to public audiences as well to carry the message of what science and infection is about. Uh, he was one of the principal architects of the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, uh, which has had a major effect and probably save millions of lives in the developing world. Now, in recognition of this, uh, he's only acquired 42 honorary degrees and has authored more than 1,200 scientific papers. He's a member of the National Academy, and he's received many awards, probably among the most prestigious of the National Medal of Science, uh, the Lasker Award for Public Service, and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. That's not bad for a day's work. <clears throat> Our second speaker is a new arrival at the NIH. Vincent Munster is from Holland, where he received his PhD degree at Erasmus University in Rotterdam, where he studied evolution and pathogenesis of avian influenza virus. Uh, he came to the Laboratory of Virology here in 2009 and in 2013 as a principal investigator established the Virus Ecology Unit, which has its purpose to elucidate the ecology of emerging viruses and drivers of zoonotic and cross-species transmission. Now, he works in the Rocky Mountain Laboratory, which is a part of NIH that's in God's country out in Montana, but it also contains state-of-the-art high and maximum containment facilities because of the agents that he works with. But not content to be only in Montana, his work carries him all over the world where major infections have occurred like Ebola and more recently uh, MERS. Uh, so Vincent is going to talk about zoonotic transmission uh, cross-species infection. Where do these viruses come from? And how do they get into man? And maybe where do they go from there? At any rate, it's a great pleasure to have both of you here today. And perhaps Tony, you would begin. Thank you. Hi.
Thanks, Wynn. It's a real pleasure to be here with you this evening. Uh, as you heard from Wynn, I'm going to talk about uh, this topic of, he asked me to make that title. I would have never made a title like that. <laughs> but <laughs> it's, it's not neat. <laughs> All right. So it's Ebola, MERS, and the likelihood of more epidemics. But actually, I'm really going to talk to you about emerging infectious diseases, uh, including these important ones that have been on our radar screen most recently. So when one thinks of emerging infectious diseases, I think it really is important and enjoyable to put it into a broad historical perspective because this issue of plagues and outbreaks have really transformed civilizations over the centuries. And there are a couple of really great books. I'm sure you're familiar with them by Jared Diamond and William McNeil and others that have showed the influence of diseases how they've transformed everything from political to economic situations throughout the world. So this is something that's not new with us. It's an inherent part of our civilization is the emergence and reemergence of plagues. In fact, if you look historically, going back to the 14th century with the very well-recognized bubonic or black plague, which was Yersinia pestis, through the plagues that are shown on the slide, and I won't go through each and every one of them, one of them is in the relatively modern era that you've heard a lot about, and I'll get back to that, and that is the so-called Spanish influenza, which at the time killed between 50 and 100 million people, which in the population relative to today would be equivalent to several hundreds of millions of people if we had the 1918 influenza today. So these are things, again, that continue to transform. Now, what has happened over the years, though, is that there have been an amazing amount of progress in the control of infectious diseases. Shown on the slide, everything from the germ theory, recognizing that microbes cause diseases. There have been changes and improvements in sanitation, hygiene, importantly, vector control, the all-important discovery of antimicrobials, the development of vaccines, the implementation of vaccines program, and our ability to monitor and detect infections as they outbreak. And because of all of this, what we have seen over the years is a dramatic decrease in the mortality rate due to infections. And if you take the United States as an example, it goes all the way down to what you see here. But this is still a very important number. But when you look globally, it's much different. Now, you might ask, what is this spike here? I remember years ago when I was presenting before the Congress about the importance of what vaccines have done for infectious diseases. I wanted to impress them with this, and they kept on focusing on that. And that was the pandemic flu of 1918, which actually was pretty good because it got me an extra $20 million for influenza. <laughs> but other than that, it was, it, was, it was a good slide. Anyway, what's happened is that there have been some understandable but nonetheless inappropriate utterances by public officials over the years that the era of infectious diseases was over. One person in particular, Iden Cockburn, in 1963 actually said, sincerely, we can look forward with confidence to considerable degree of freedom from infectious diseases at a time not too distant in the future, and that, I love this, all the major infections will have disappeared. Well, the problem, you're looking for one that works. Did you find one that works? So I don't know if this one works. It doesn't work. Don't worry about it. It's no big deal. I'll, I'll dance around. Don't worry. Um, so the problem with this is that it is inaccurate from a standpoint of what's going on because he said this in 63 when there were 2 million deaths of tuberculosis and a million deaths of malaria. And it is not only a complete provincial craziness. How can you say that in the United States? when millions of people are dying from infectious diseases throughout the rest of the world. But it is what it is, and people were saying that. If you look at the reality, infectious diseases, although they've gone down in the United States, are still a major cause of death worldwide. There are 55 million deaths a year in the world. About 16 to 18% of them are due to infections. Now, if you look at what's called DALYs, a Disability Adjusted Life Years, which is a combination of death and disability, and you rank them in the developing world, particularly Southern Africa, according to papers that came out last year in The Lancet from Chris Murray, the infectious disease is the, still the leading cause of DALYs 
of people from birth to age 49 in the developing world. Not in the developed world, but in the developing world. And since we live in a, you, you, I like you, you keep trying, don't you? You're right. <laughs> you know what it is? It's the white screen that doesn't show it. That, don't worry about it. We're good. We're good. It, it doesn't show on a white screen. You're taking minutes away from me. Right. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. So infectious disease are about 16 to 18%, and it really is a very important. So we're going to talk a little bit about infectious diseases in general. So I tend to like to categorize things into different buckets to make them a bit more clear to people when I'm talking to them about it. So you talk about established infectious diseases, new infectious diseases, and re-emerging infectious diseases. So let's take a look first at the established infectious disease. My definition of an established infectious disease is one that you can reasonably accurately predict the global morbidity and mortality from year to year. And let me show you an example. For example, if you look at respiratory illnesses, it kills about 2 million people a year. That doesn't change much from year to year. Diarrheal disease is about 1.8 million. It's interesting that HIV AIDS used to be a newly emerging disease, but it's graduated after 34 years into an established infectious disease. But there's TB, hepatitis, malaria. We know all about those. Those are established. But what we're going to focus on for the purpose of today's discussion is both newly emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. So I'll tell you a little story about that. When I gave my first testimony before Congress in 1984, the first year that I was director, I wanted to make the point to the Congress that new diseases emerge. So I sketched a little map myself, and then I had an artist do it. And I said, look at what we have here. We have HIV as a new disease. So I've been testifying now for 31 years, and every year I add one or two and sometimes three new diseases to the map. So it doesn't bore them. They get a new map every year. And this is what the map looks like right now with a variety of things. Now, we obviously don't have time to go through each and every one of those, but I want to dance through a few of them to give you an example of the difference between newly emerging, re-emerging, and then I had to put deliberately because that's when we had the anthrax attack. You might remember back in the fall of 2001, right after the 9-11 attack in New York and the Pentagon. So this is just an example of a few of the newly emerging infectious diseases and re-emerging infectious diseases that have occurred only in the year 2015 through this month in 2016. Everything you remember, the measles outbreak in California, drug-resistant TB and malaria, the, pan, the, the bird flus, mares, chikungunya, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We could spend an entire lecture on each and every one of these, but they're all real emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases. So let's take a look at some of the issues that get involved in this. Why do you get emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases? I think Vincent's going to tell you probably more about that than I will, but there are things generally, if I were to take these seven bullets and put them into one, it's how we perturb our environment, one way or the other. The demography and behavior, technology and industry, economic development, travel, public health measures, ecology, microbial adaptation, all of these have an impact. Now, one of the things that you're going to hear from one of the world's experts on this now, is the, the issue of where these infections come from. 75% of the new infections that afflict mankind are zoonotic. Namely, they're fundamentally animal viruses that jump species and ultimately adapt themselves to human. When they adapt themselves well to humans, the way influenza has done, the way HIV has done, they become outbreaks and sometimes pandemics. Sometimes they're just curiosities when they jump species and a handful or more of people get infected. It's still a zoonotic, but it isn't a major emerging outbreak. So those are the two things you have to distinguish in your mind. Air travel is interesting. This is one of those, grand, those, uh, those schematics that show you for every green line is a flight that took off today throughout the world. And if you just take a look at 
the, 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 the connectivity between different countries. If you get a good flight, there's no place in the world that's more than 19 hours away. If you get a direct flight from here over to China or here over to Japan, which is directly on the other side of the world, that's about an 18 to 19 hour flight. So that's pretty good compared to what was merely many decades ago. So let's take a look at new emerging infections and I'll go quickly through them. So HIV is the mother of all new emerging infections. Why? Because right now there have been, as you know, as I'm gonna show you, 70 million infections. So that's not a blip on the radar screen. That ranks in the short list of a handful of the worst pandemics ever. So if you wanna list them, the bubonic plague, influenza of 1918, measles, et cetera, HIV is right there in a small handful, which is, I kind of think, interesting for those of us who are interested in infectious diseases, because as infectious disease people, we're living through one of the worst pandemics in the history of mankind. And we tend to kind of forget that because we get used to it. So it all started off the way these outbreaks do with a seemingly inconspicuous report that caught my attention 34 and a half years ago when I was in my laboratory, which was interesting. It was five gay men from Los Angeles who presented with pneumocystis pneumonia. Everybody thought that that meant nothing. When I saw this, I, I, I kind of have a, a particular uh, emotional interest in this particular MMWR because it actually changed my life. When I saw that MMWR, I didn't believe the first one with five gay men, but when the second one came out a month later of 26 men, also all gay, not only from LA, but from San Francisco and New York, I said, oh my God, this is a brand new disease. And I stopped what I was doing and did everything and started admitting these people who we didn't even know what the name of the disease was. We were calling it GRID. Fast forward 34 years and look what you have. There are now 37, 37 million people living with HIV, 1.2 million deaths, and 2 million new infections each year. The science has been incredible. If there's ever one disease in which the scientific community responded with an extraordinary amount of accomplishments, it's been HIV. Believe it or not, this is a picture of me making rounds in 1981. And I show it not because I want to show a picture of myself, because it reminds me that for about five to seven years of my life, I was kind of, I wouldn't say depressed, that's clinical. I wasn't feeling too good because every one of my patients died. I had hundreds and hundreds of patients a year because we filled our 52 bed uh, ward on the 11th floor and they all died. The, the median life expectancy was eight months to a year and a half. But what happened because of the science is that we now have more than 30 drugs, which when used in combination of three and sometimes four, we've completely transformed the lives of HIV infected individuals such that if a person comes in to the same clinic now and is 20 years old and newly infected and we start them on an antiretroviral, you can predict that they'll live an additional 50, five, zero years. I tell you that because we tend to take it for granted now. And when new fellows come in and rotate through my service, they take it for granted. Somebody comes in, you give them a pill of a triple, boom, it's done, you're good. But they don't know or have the experience that every patient before this came along died and now they have a normal life expectancy, which again goes down historically as one of the, I think the most important accomplishments in biomedical research. On Sunday, some of you may read, I wrote an editorial in the Washington Post, and if you haven't had a chance to, to click online, read it because it really explains in detail what I don't have time to do right now, is that we have no excuses whatsoever not to end the AIDS epidemic because we have all the necessary treatments and prevention. Treatment as prevention, pre-exposure prophylaxis, it can actually stop the epidemic in its track. It becomes an implementation issue. Do we have the political will globally to go out, seek out, test, treat, and get people into care, which we're not doing very well at? Okay, let's move to another new virus. In 1976, Ebola was a newly emerging disease. The Ebola that we've experienced recently that I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about is a re-emerging disease. But the first time we recognized it was in Southern Africa, in Zaire, and in South Africa, in which there was a new disease that was discovered, Ebola, 
was the first time we experienced that. And since then, there have been about 24 outbreaks, usually anywhere from two or three patients up to a couple of hundred patients. We'll get back to Ebola as a re-emerging disease. SARS was an interesting new emerging disease. It started off, as you know, thinking the Chinese either thought or didn't want to let anybody know that it was influenza in Guangdong province. Somebody who went from Guangdong to Hong Kong brought the infection with them and did something which is an epidemiologist's dream, if you want to call it that. That sounds sort of morbid, but it is. Somebody went into a hotel, the Metropol Hotel in Hong Kong, infected a number of people who then went off from the Metropol Hotel into different parts of the world and spread the infection. Toronto got hit pretty badly. The United States really not so much. And what happened very quickly is that we went from a handful of cases to more than 8,000 cases and about 775 deaths. Now, as we were scrambling to develop vaccines and therapeutics, good, basic, low-tech, not rocket science, public health measures completely put an end to the epidemic. Things like identification, isolation, some quarantine, and that was the end of that. So it was a reasonably good public health structure that did it. Interestingly, we developed a vaccine for SARS, but we never had to use it. Now, then came MERS coronavirus. Interesting that SARS is a coronavirus and MERS is a coronavirus. And if you go to your microbiology class before these two, coronavirus was a wimpy little virus that causes the common cold. But it obviously isn't because there are some coronaviruses that are pretty dangerous like this one. So MERS came along, and then what we had is we had it bring, it, it's springing up in the Middle East. You'll probably hear a little bit more about that from, from Vincent. There were now uh, over 1,600 cases, about 584 deaths. These countries here are not primary infections. The infections originate in the Middle East and have gone because people travel to other countries, including a couple in the United States. The country that really got hit was South Korea. And it was interesting because it's a prime example of someone with an infectious disease that's transmissible, that when you don't realize what you're dealing with, you can have a real problem the way the South Koreans have. Because a person came from the Middle East to South Korea and was visibly ill and went to a couple of emergency rooms and no one put two and two together and implemented what you learn in medical school. What you learn in medical school, when someone comes in in an infectious disease, you ask them, where have you traveled lately? So if they had asked this person, where have you traveled lately? And he said, Qatar or Jordan, you would have think, bingo, maybe it was Mares because Mares was all over the newspaper. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. But we did mobilize the, uh, the scientific community. This is a, an early vaccine candidate that was developed here in the Vaccine Research Center by Barney Graham. Uh, and then there are re-emerging infectious diseases, which are many more plentiful than newly emerging infections, such as multiple and extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis. We just had a big meeting downtown that I participated in with Tom Frieden from the CDC and people from USAID on the president's initiative on combating multiple drug-resistant TB. It, I, an interesting fact. It costs $17,000 to treat a case of garden variety TB. It costs about $100,000 to treat a case of multiple drug resistant TB. It costs $435,000 to treat a case of extensively drug resistant TB. Of course, it takes at least a couple of years to treat them. and The people essentially have to be in the hospital for months and months. Then there's drug resistant malaria, we're starting to see in the border between Cambodia and Thailand the emergence of artemisinin resistance. Bad news, because artemisinin is one of the best drugs we have ever had for malaria, and now we're starting to get drug-resistant malaria. Then there's the famous antimicrobial resistance, which we're facing right here on this campus, for those of you who might remember, with the carbapenem-resistant Enterobacteriaceae 
epidemic that we had at the clinical center a few years ago where we had 18 cases and 11 deaths. That's a re-emerging infection. Drug resistance is re-emerging. And then West Nile. So one of the ways you re-emerge is if you occur in a different geographic location where you've never seen the virus before. Because West Nile virus for centuries has existed in the Middle East, particularly in Israel, and mostly in the West Nile area of Africa. And yet we've never seen it in the United States until it emerged about 12, 15 years ago in the United States because somebody or something, a mosquito, a bird, or a person got on a plane in Tel Aviv and landed at Kennedy Airport. And then all of a sudden we wound up with now endemic West Nile virus. And that's how it happened. It happened in 1999, 16 years ago, and we kept on getting asked. The department and the White House was asking me, do you think we'd have a West Nile outbreak in the United States? And I said, obviously, of course. And they said, well, how could you be so sure? It's because we have the three things that West Nile needs. We have people, we have mosquitoes, and we have birds. And that's exactly what the West Nile epidemic needed. And now we have this. So here's where I told them it would happen. And they said, oh, you're crazy, Fauci. You're just an infectious disease guy that wants more money for your institute. That's true, but it's unrelated <laughs> to this. And then all of a sudden, this happened. And now we're having varying degrees depending upon the season, the mosquitoes, the weather, and all things like that. So we went ahead and tried to develop a vaccine for West Nile, and we're actually quite successful. I'm telling you this vaccine story because we've developed a vaccine for almost every outbreak that has occurred, and the pharmaceutical companies have a problem with making a major investment because who are you going to vaccinate for West Nile? Everybody in the United States? Unlikely. So there's no big market. The same thing with mares. There's not a big enthusiasm about this in the United States. You're going to see the same thing with a number of others that I'm going to show you. Then there's dengue. Again, dengue has been in Asia and in Africa forever. And then it comes over to the Americas. In Brazil now, dengue is an epidemic. It's more than an epidemic. It's a pandemic because there are a number of other cases involved. And the same thing happened with dengue. Dengue is an amazing disease because if you look at the tropical belt across the globe, there are about 400 million infections. That's a lot of infections. It doesn't kill a lot of people, but it does kill some because you have some complications of dengue, hemorrhagic fever and others that are associated with dengue. And again, we have a problem now because as you might expect, there are now an outbreak, not a major, but a pretty good outbreak in Hawaii of dengue. So not only did it come to the Americas, it comes way out to one of our states in the Pacific. Now, dengue vaccines are moving along. There's a dengue vaccine that was approved, the Sanofi candidate, which is now approved in Mexico, Brazil, and the Philippines. And right here in the NIH and NIAID, we have a vaccine candidate that's going into phase three trial in Brazil. So the science of developing a vaccine for an infection that the body makes a pretty good immune response as isn't that difficult. We have difficulties with vaccines that the body doesn't make a good immune response in, like malaria and HIV and tuberculosis. That's the reason why we don't have it. It would be wonderful to have a vaccine for all of those because everybody would want it. People aren't that interested in vaccines that they're not going to be able to use. And here again, I mean, you can just go on and on. It's very exciting to me, but it can almost get boring. Oh, now yet another one. Here's chikungunya. So chikungunya was kind of a fun infection when I was in medical school because no one could pronounce it very well when we used to <laughs> go in the books. But as a matter of fact, it again was a disease that was in Asia and in Africa. And then all of a sudden it lands in the Western hemisphere in the Caribbean and now it's a major outbreak in the Caribbean, which is wreaking havoc on the tourist trade in places like the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. So this was the global distribution of chikungunya before the outbreak in the Western Hemisphere. Then what happened, the first locally acquired cases were seen in 2013, and then boom, all of a sudden now we have Brazil, 
Mexico and the Caribbean have a pandemic of chikungunya with over a million 300,000 cases last year. Again, we have vaccines that we're developing right here at the, at the VRC with Julie Ledgerward and, and Barney Graham and others, as well as some of our extramural people. Now let's get back to Ebola because I'm gonna spend a little time on Ebola. So Ebola, I told you in 1976, started off as a newly emerging infection. In 2013, 14, 15, I say 13 because the first case was in December. In 2014 and 15, it became a newly emerging disease. And it's a very interesting story because if you look at the total number of cases of Ebola from 1976 to the present time, excluding this outbreak, there was about 2,400 cases with about 12,000 deaths. So now this epidemic is multiple fold more than all of the other combined. And the reason for that was that it took place not in a remote region, but in a region that had a certain characteristics, porous borders, high population, big cities, no health infrastructure, which is just exactly what an epidemic really likes to see if you want to spread. So let me tell you a little bit about Ebola. There are multiple different subtypes of Ebola. The one that we were dealing with was Ebola Zaire, which was said to have a 50 to 90% fatality rate. But we know now that if you can give intensive care to people, the fatality rate is much, much, much lower than that. But when you're out in the field trying to take care of people with no uh, capabilities, then it becomes very high. It's got an enzoic cycle and an epizoic cycle, which means it is in animals, in bats, in non-human primates. I'm sure Vincent is gonna mention something about that since he's been studying that. It isn't particularly clear what the details of that enzoetic cycle is. It's pretty clear once it gets into man, either by touching or getting involved with a dead animal, a bat or a, or a bush meat, a chimp or ape or what have you, that it's spread from man to man by bodily fluids, by objects such as fomites, namely clothing that you have material on. What's material? We say body fluids. It's vomit, it's feces, it's a variety of other things when someone is really very sick, as well as infected animals. And it has a very, I think, well-described typical course now. You get exposed, about eight to 10 days or two to 21 days later, you get sick. Now that we've seen thousands of people, this is pretty tight. The, the incubation period, they say two to 21, it really is very tight around eight to 10 days that we now have the good epidemiology. Then you get weakness, fever, and influenza-like symptoms. So that's the confusion of what it is until you start making the right diagnosis. Then you have protracted vomiting, diarrhea, dehydration, confusion, and then if you don't get replenishment of fluid, you wind up getting into hypovolemic shock and organ system failure. I'm gonna tell you a little bit something about that because I was a little bit incorrect in what I was thinking about the ability to replace fluid until I took care of Ebola patients. And then that became very clear to me that it was a little bit different than what I thought. And I'll explain to that in a second. So in March of 2014, they, the, 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 the Guinea Ministry of Health reported an outbreak in Guinea, actually related to a child, a patient, a two-year-old in Guinea who was infected and it was not properly recognized. And through the typical way we know, family members taking care of someone, funeral uh, processes where you wash and embrace the body, a whole bunch of people in Guinea got infected. And then it was only when you came into March of 2014, did we start with this. And this was a scary thing. So red indicates the province where the infection are. Now, the interesting thing is, if you know a little bit about the geography of West Africa, notice that Guinea wraps itself around Liberia and Sierra Leone. So these countries are like one country. And there are big cities like Monrovia and Freetown that got deeply involved. Unlike back in the 70s and 80s, when little villages in Uganda would have a mini outbreak and you could easily take care of it not when you have situations in the city. 
Then it went like this, May 2014, July 2014, October 2014, February 15, June 2015, and then all of a sudden it turned around and shut off. It didn't shut off because of a vaccine. It didn't shut off because of a therapy. It shut off because people started doing what they should have been doing in the beginning, namely identify, isolate, contact trace, and watch out for funeral services so that you don't expose a lot of people at the funeral. And that's exactly what happened. Now, what are the factors that facilitate spread? I have said publicly a lot on television and in the newspapers that we would not have an outbreak of Ebola in the United States. And the reason we wouldn't have it is not because we're so uh, presumptuous about it, is that if you have a healthcare system that's able to identify, isolate, and contact trace, you will have an occasional case. Of course, someone's gonna come from West Africa, be that a healthcare worker or someone that just slips through the screening, but you're not gonna have an outbreak because these are the things they had in West Africa. Poor infrastructure, they never saw Ebola before. Do you know in Liberia, it's amazing. There's one physician for every 70,000 people in the country. So that means, I did the math, there are more physicians on K Street Northwest in Washington, D.C. than in the entire country of Liberia. And they need physicians. Anyway, you have frequent travel, regional conflicts. They didn't trust us when we went there because they had just had civil wars and a lot of disruption. I wrote an article in uh, online in August, but it was printed in September, saying exactly what I'm saying right now, that the reason there's an outbreak because of a disparity of health care. If they had a health care system that was able to do the identification, they wouldn't have had it. So let's take a look at what we did, just very quickly, because I think talking about emerging infections, it's also important to emphasize how you respond to them. So first of all, with vaccines, right here in the clinical center, we did the first phase one trial of the chimp adeno vector uh, um, a, uh, Ebola vaccine. That was one of the two components of the vaccines that we used. We did a phase two trial in Liberia. We were gonna do a phase three trial, but as we were doing the trial, the, the, the infections disappeared on their own and there were no more people to do the trial on. That's good news, bad news. Good news, people are getting better, bad news, that you can't prove the vaccine works. And even the one in Guinea, the, the data on that are still a little soft as to really how effective it is. There were therapeutics, one of the most uh, important of which was the um, ZMAP, which is a triple antibody against the Ebola glycoprotein that was developed uh, by a company and then had some collaborations. And we did a study which is actually still ongoing. We're gonna call the study off probably in two weeks because there are no more cases. But it was doing optimum care versus optimum care plus ZMAP. It's the only randomized study of any therapeutic in the entire Ebola outbreak. Everything else was just giving drugs to people thinking it might work or not, which is not the way to do things because you'll never get an answer with that. Then I wanna tell you a little bit about our own personal experience here because it tells me something about Ebola that you would have never learned by going out into the field. So we, NIH, the Bethesda campus here, was one of three of the designated Ebola treatment facilities together with Emory and Nebraska. And you all know the great publicity that went with our taking care of and discharging Nina Pham, who was one of the two nurses that got infected from Eric Duncan in Texas. The other one was Amber Vincent. They shipped Amber to Emory. They shipped Nina to us here. She did very well, but to be honest, she wasn't ever critically ill in that she was in danger of dying. Here's her getting discharged by our incredible team of study nurses who were involved in taking care of. But the real challenge came in something you didn't hear about because it was a patient who did not want to be identified except to say that he was a healthcare worker that was working in Paul Farmer's unit of Partners in Health in Sierra Leone. 
and he got infected, but he didn't want anybody to know who he was, so it didn't get the publicity that Nina Pham got. But it was one of the most incredible experiences that we had at the clinical center because this is him coming in to uh, the side entrance off the clinical center. And here we are. This is Dick Ch uh, D uh, Dan Chertow and myself getting ready to go in and see the patient. And you got a good feel for what it was like to take care of people because when you put that suit on, you really can't stay in it for any more than two hours even with an air-conditioned room, because you wind up just going almost claustrophobic with this horrible thing that you got to wear when you're taking care of a really, really sick person that you had to intubate, that you had to put a central line in. So it was very, very stressful to do that. And the reason I, I say that is because that was one of the reasons why some of the healthcare workers got infected there, because they get so tired, they get infected as they take off their PPE obviously not as they put them on. And a lot of people got infected there. So that's us talking about going in. The rotation was one infectious disease person, one intensivist. I was the ID guy, Dan was the, the, uh, the uh, intensivist. And we would just rotate in every couple of hours and we had about a total of about 15 of us. So that's Dan getting ready to get dressed. Here's me getting dressed, uh, putting all this equipment on and that's Dan and I in with the patient. Now, the reason I show this is that there wasn't a single minute when his blood pressure was below normal. So we were always saying that all you got to do is keep somebody's blood pressure normal and they won't have organ failure. We were wrong. There's a certain subset of people who, even if you keep their blood pressure normal, they wind up getting successive organ systems. So while we had perfect control of his fluid volume and his electrolytes, he progressively went into respiratory failure, renal failure, cardiovascular collapse, and meningoencephalitis. And he still lived, and he lived because he was in a really good intensive care unit taking care of people who understood intensive care. I mean, we understood infection, but the intensive care guys are the one, and ladies are the one that brought him through. Greatly, he walked out of the hospital well, feeling great with a nice NIH sweatshirt that we bought him. <laughs> okay, now the other study that we have is a survivor study. I'm going to be likely, depending on the travel arrangements, to go to Liberia on Saturday with Cliff Lane and check up on this survivor study, which we're finding some very interesting long-range complications in people who have recovered from Ebola. And again, finally now, Zika virus. You know, the, the other thing that's occupying a lot of my time right now this one is another surprise, like chikungunya, like dengue, like all the others. Formerly, Zika was a disease that was in Asia and Africa. Isn't that kind of a recurring theme? Asia, Africa. Here, variety of reasons, because this is an arthropod-borne virus. The virology, it's a flavivirus. So you all know flavivirus, the same thing as West Nile, the same thing as dengue. It's the same kind of a virus. It was first described in 1947 in the Zika forest in Uganda, first case in 1952. It's spread by Aedes aegypti, and that is the link. We have Aedes in South America, we have Aedes in the Caribbean, and we have not only Aedes aegypti, but Aedes albopictus in the United States. So the United States, as you know from your time here in the summer, has a lot of mosquitoes. It's generally a mild disease. Incubation period, three to 12 days. Four to, five in, four, to five, four to five individuals are really asymptomatic. When you get sick, you get fever, conjunctivitis, myalgia, et cetera. So these were the countries that had Zika prior to 2015. This is what's going on right now, an explosive pandemic in Brazil, in Mexico, in Colombia, and a variety of places in South America. Now, as with many viruses, you can get Guillain-Barre. Guillain-Barre following influenza is very common. You can even see it sometimes with vaccination in a rare case. But Guillain-Barre as a neurological, somewhat autoimmune response to a virus is not unexpected. There was an outbreak in Polynesia, but now we're starting to see something that's really scary and that is microcephaly in babies born of women who were pregnant during the outbreak. Now, we don't know definitively if Zika 
is related to microcephaly in kids who are born when their mother was pregnant during the outbreak. But we do know something that's epidemiologically striking, and that is these are the number of Zika cases 2010, excuse me, microcephaly, 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, and this is now a 20-fold increase in the number of the microcephaly cases in Brazil to the point now, even though there's no definitive proof that the Brazilian health officials are telling pregnant women to be incredibly meticulous about putting on mosquito repellent, but also even avoiding getting pregnant. That's a pretty big deal for health authorities to be telling the population to avoid getting pregnant because of this. So this is a work in progress. It remains to be seen what this is going to be. I, for those of you who follow the New England Journal online, I, have a, I just looked at the galleys. I have a paper coming out tomorrow or Thursday in the New England Journal on Zika that sort of summarizes a lot of the stuff that, you, that I'm speaking here. So let me close up and leave some time for questions. What this tells us is that we are living in a delicate balance between the amazing capability of microbes to emerge, to reemerge, and to persist, balanced against our ability to implement public health measures to do research and technological advances. There will always be emer emerging microbes. I mean, uh, I, when I tell that to lay audiences, and particularly the Congress, there, it's, I'm not going to say, you know, guess what? Give me enough resources and there won't be any more emerging microbes. No, give me more resources and we'll respond better to emerging microbes. But you're never, ever going to stop microbes from emerging. They just have an evolutionary capability of adapting in a way that allows them to emerge, which is the reason why I have written, and this is my last slide with David Morins, my colleague, and, and Greg Folkers, that we wrote a, a, a review article in Lancet Infectious Diseases about eight years ago, and we entitled it Emerging Infectious Diseases, a Perpetual Challenge, because just as emerging infections will in fact continue to go, we're gonna continue to be challenged because we're never gonna be totally prepared for them. So for those of you who are looking for a job that you will never get fired, go into infectious diseases. Thank you. All right, so we have time for questions, and uh, uh, we'd appreciate if you would speak into the microphone, which we'll give you, because there are a lot of people online. Here, uh, Luba. Uh, how come that uh, Ivory Coast was spared? They closed the border. But what about the animals that closed that don't know about that? No, no, but the animals continue are getting sick with, uh, with, with Ebola. It's when the animals get exposed to the humans. So we don't actually know what the real true reservoir is of Ebola. We know that, that apes get infected, and we know you could find it in bats, but that enzootic cycle is not particularly very well worked out. But the reason the countries around those three African, because they were actually closed off. They were very careful of not letting them in. Thanks for that uh, talk, Tony. So I'm Rick Burzon with NIMHD. And um, so I spent uh, three months last summer working with Cliff Lane and others in Guinea. And just have a, a question about the status of, of vaccines and the therapeutic ZMAP uh, because uh, no patients. So how is that going to play out in terms of what happens the next time? Okay, so what will likely happen because of the positive though not definitive results from the Guinea uh, ring trial, that at least VSV, if we have another outbreak, will likely be given in a compassionate way and an acceler not an accelerated approval because there's not enough data to approve it by the FDA. The, the, the WHO will likely ask to, to deploy it on an emergency basis. Simultaneous with that, and hope we, we hope there never is another outbreak to do it, but if there is, that will happen. Subsequent to that, or on the same time, we're going to do a non-inferiority immunogenic study where we're going to look at the immune response to VSV compared to the immune response to chimp adeno and human adeno vector and determine if they're the same 
So you'll have more than one vaccine that might be available. With the ZMAP, we have 72 people that have been accrued. The DSMB keeps looking at the data, and it wasn't good enough or bad enough to stop the study. But it still may be that if you look at the data after you do formally stop it because there are no new infections, that you can actually say there was a benefit in decreasing hospital days or uh, uh, quickness to the decrease in viremia. I don't think it's going to be a slam dunk uh, result on mortality. Otherwise, they would have stopped the study if there was. Um, I wonder if you can comment on the um, treatment by um, whatever DTT or whatever it is of the mosquitoes, because we had some decrease, significant decrease in malaria when DTT was sprayed in certain parts of the world. And they're back with vengeance with drug-resistant malaria to the Zika virus. Well, you know, there is an ongoing argument that the stopping of aggressive mosquito control with DDT is, was a mistake, even though there was feeling that there was, you know, a lot of environmental reasons to do that. There are still good ways to control mosquitoes. I mean, you can control mosquitoes with malaria. In some countries, just bed nets and indoor spraying have decreased malaria dramatically in certain countries. Hi, a quick follow on to the ZMAP study question. Are there going to be longitudinal studies of those who were of your case control study to look at the long-term repercussions and if that has a positive effect? Yeah. Yes, the, the ZMAP recipients are part of the survivor study. So we will be able to look at ZMAP survivors compared to people who didn't get ZMAP. All right, good question. So can you summarize for us, Tony, what's the status now of the development of public health measures in West Africa, in the underdeveloped world? Is there any, is there, is it being taken seriously and are there ventures uh, I mean, uh, other than Gates or something, what about intrinsically? Do you see a more Well, there, every time something like this happens, when there's, there's a big surge of enthusiasm, people write blogs, people write articles, WHO makes statements, and then when it goes off the radar screen, nothing happens. And the reason is that countries themselves have to make the commitment that health infrastructure is an important part of their budgetary agenda, even though when they don't have a lot of money, because some of these countries don't put anything into healthcare infrastructure. Now, the outside rich world can come in and help. What we're doing a little bit differently is that at least we have made a commitment that when you go in and help in an emergency situation, you don't leave unless you leave some sustainable healthcare infrastructure. And when Cliff Lane went over and spent a lot of time in Liberia setting up the vaccine and the therapy trials, we took a lot of the money that was given us in the supplementary budget, and we renovated a number of the clinics in, in Redemption Hospital and JFK Hospital in Monrovia so that when we get out of there, they will have at least some degree of infrastructure. We've trained them. You know, Heinz and, 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 uh, and Vincent went over and trained a lot of their people how to do the diagnostic tests. So you just got to make a commitment. You're not just going to go in and come out. You're going to try and leave a sustainable infrastructure. Please. Dr. Fauci, the question I have is one of the last examples discussed about Ebola, where March 2015 case, where you said that there were organ failures, so is it only related to that patient or you get that as a general trend with all patients? No, and you is, don't. Good, no, go ahead, finish, I'm sorry. That's okay. So, and then is it something that is related to the virus itself or has to do with the state of the patient in which the patient is taken into care? Okay, those are great questions. So, based on experience that our people have had people like Dan Chertow, who spent a considerable amount of time there taking care of patients. It is our general impression, and 
it isn't 100 percent because, but it's a pretty strong impression that if you look at all people who get Ebola, and there may be, you know, what the initial inoculum is or what your immune response is, there are going to be maybe 20 percent of people who get sick who don't really have a lot of problems, don't even need serious rehydration. Uh, so maybe another 20% who can get by with oral hydration. Then there may be another 40% or so who will need intravenous central line type of, of replenishment of fluid. If you do that, they will be fine. Then there's about another 20%, maybe 15 to 20% of people that no matter what you do with replenishment of fluid, the virus will attack their organ system. So there's organ system failure associated with hypovolemic shock. You get kidney failure, pulmonary failure, all that thing. And then there's organ system damage due to direct damage of the virus. Those 20% or so, maybe it's 15, maybe it's 20, if they're not in an intensive care setting, you can give them all the fluid you want, they're gonna die. And the reason our patients survived was because we had him monitored 24 hours a day for the 12 days that he was acutely ill. And he came in reasonably well. I mean, I saw him, I greeted him at the door, you know, and brought him in, put him in bed, got him undressed and all that, talking to him. And then all of a sudden, over a period of a day or two, he just completely crashed. And he crashed with a central line in without monitoring his blood pressure that it never ever went below a level that you'd be concerned. So that's definitive proof that it was the virus that did that, not fluids. Hi, another quick question. Uh, sure. Regarding infrastructure building in developing nations, if we were going to be directing funds towards any particular project, what would you see as the most valuable in preventing the emergence and spread of these infectious diseases? Training nurses. Uh, training non-physician healthcare providers. There will never be enough doctors to do it all. But, you know, if you look now at some of the countries that we give PEPFAR aid to, we have people who are not physicians and not even nurses out in the community implementing the PEPFAR program, which is working terrifically well. Seems that that might also help the U.S. as well. Um, one more quick question with regard to um, specifically the management of that patient who uh, had organ system failure. Um, is there a possibility that maybe not due to the fact that there's hypovolemia, but that the, vi uh, that the Ebola virus might actually attack red blood cells and cause hemolysis, which could uh, presumably cause organ system damage? Um, is that a possibility yeah. with regard to the cause? You know, I don't think so, because to my knowledge, Ebola doesn't directly attack red blood cells. Does it, Vincent? I don't think so. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. What's that? The hemorrhage, the um, bleeding is not from red blood cells. Yeah, 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 but that's not attacking. That's, a, that's endothelial cell problem. That's not red blood cell problem. That's an endothelial cell problem. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that the patient that you had who is in very critical care was able to survive because he was being constantly monitored for the right. entire time he was there, sort of had a whole team dedicated to his care. Right. If you had a larger number of patients come in, um, sort of at that critical level at the same time, do you think you would be able to manage the same very positive survival outcomes that you saw in the patient? No, that's a good question. We, we kind of modeled that, if you want to call it model. We felt that with the staff that we had, that we could manage two very sick persons and one not so sick person, but no more than three total. That, that's what we, we modeled, that we couldn't do any more than three. It would be physically impossible. We were almost exhausted with one. We would have been really exhausted with two, and that's why the third one would have to be not so sick. Right. All right, well, thank you very You're much. You're welcome. So there'll be new, uh, we're gonna stay. No, I can't. I have okay, all right, thank you. Okay.
time for the backwards forward round. Yeah, thanks. Can everybody hear me? Great. Uh, it's a little bit ungrateful spot to follow in the footsteps of Dr. Fauci. So <laughs> I tried to do my best and um, I put some slides together, which I think is important to get a little bit of idea of what I'm working on and personal experience. And I kind of move from flu, which I have a couple of interesting slides on, to mercy UV, and then I'll, I'll finalize with, with Ebola virus. And as, as Dr. Fauci already said, most of these emerging and re-emerging viruses have uh, what we call a reservoir in wild animals. We're talking, for instance, about non-human primates, like as, as IV is very, very well known, uh, waterfowl, for instance, avian influenza viruses, rodents, hantavirus, Lassa virus, and of course, bats, we have rabies, we have Nipah virus, we have Hendra virus, uh, Marburg virus, and we think Ebola virus originates from bats as well. And from these natural reservoirs, these viruses can somehow transmit into the human population. But this, what is very important to point out that we have like what we call amplifying reservoirs. For instance, uh, poultry, in the case of avian influenza, is one of the most predominant amplifying hosts. Low pathogenic avian influenza gets introduced into poultry, and then it actually starts in mutating into highly pathogenic viruses, and these become dangerous for humans. Uh, similar to swine, of course, we had the pandemic H1N1 outbreak. Maybe a little bit less known is the introduction of Nipah virus from Peropus fruit bats into swine population in Malaysia in 1999, and subsequent introduction into the human population. And that outbreak had a case fatality rate of around 90%, so very, very high case fatality rate. So what I'm trying to do in my lab is combine knowledge on different levels to see what we can find out about these outbreaks and how these viruses cross the species barrier, as we call it. So trying to use either genetic and protein information to somehow predict uh, host species tropism of these viruses, looking at the phenotypic properties of the viruses, moving to the individual host, the natural reservoir in this case, it's a very, very pretty fruit bat I catch in Africa, moving then into the intermediate reservoir, which I pointed out. In this case, for Mercy V, the dromedary camels, I got some nice data on that. And then, of course, the circulation of these viruses in, in a large population, tying that all together to try to understand why these viruses cross the species barrier. And I think this is a really nice slide on avian influenza or influenza A viruses. And each and every box in this phylogenetic tree is a different population. So which one, the one which stands out is in light blue. That's the human population. And then we have here avian wild waterfowl. This is actually American avian and this is Eurasian avian. So a couple of things stand out that the evolution in different populations is different. So we see in humans very nice punctuated evolution, kind of coincides with the antigenic drift, but this is not one of the proteins on antigenic drift, but we see this evolution. And then we see the evolution nicely separated in the reservoir, which is wild waterfowl. And what you can see is that avian influenza in North America is different from those in Eurasia, kind of nicely shown over here. So basically, different host population exert different evolutionary pressures on the virus. Another level of looking at that is trying to understand how transmission occurs. This is again influenza virus, and I've been looking a lot in dabbling ducks. And if you sample dabbling ducks, you take both an oral sample and a cloaca sample. And what you see in dabbling ducks it's predominantly virus is shed via the cloaca, which of course makes for a very nice route of transmission because these are dabbling ducks, which means they feed up ending in the water. So if you defecate in the water with a lot of virus, it's very easy for the virus to transmit to the second one. This is actually not true for geese. And here we see white front geese. So if you kind of know what geese does, so if you go out to the mall and you see all these geese there, you see actually all the turds laying out on the ground, right? So this doesn't work for geese. So the influenza virus has to do something different, and it actually does. So if you look at where the virus is predominantly found in these geese, it's actually the respiratory tract. 
similar to humans. So these viruses can actually change on the behavior of the host. This is another thing. What kind of effect does a virus in the natural reservoir have? So people commonly think, well, it's a natural reservoir, so it doesn't have any pathogenic effect. That's kind of common knowledge, which is kind of weird, because I always think like, well, it's kind of similar to like childhood diseases, even, even though like everybody now nowadays gets vaccinated for most of them, even though the mortality rate might not be that high, but it definitely has, has like an impact. So again, we're looking at Buick swans. So basically, this is how we catch them. So you have these cannons, and you shoot a net over them. Then over here, you see a caught Buick swan, and his, here is where I'm sampling. And this is in the top of uh, the northern part of the Netherlands. This is what I still do my PhD. But the most interesting thing is, what happens if you start comparing infected animals from not infected animals? And I was actually working together with ecologists who were very interested in the physiology of migration. So these are migratory animals. So what they actually need to do when they're in the Netherlands on the wintering grounds, they need to fatten up. They need to get big to start them migrating back to their breeding grounds. And you can actually measure that. So you can actually, here we have labeled these animals with a satellite transmission collar. And you can actually look what they call the abdominal profile index, how big this animal is getting. These, these guys are actually looking at those animals for duration of time. They actually count the numbers of droppings they actually put down in an hour, and they can actually measure the efficiency of taking up nutrients. I didn't know that. I was just a virologist. like, oh. <laughs> so then I started looking at the ones which were infected with a very benign avian influenza virus, so no high pathogenic strain. And you can see all the measurements were up. But most striking is when they start migrating, all the healthy ones directly started migrating. When was their time? However, the sick ones stayed around for a long time. So what kind of impact does this have? So if you go to your breeding grounds, you want to be the first because you're going to pick the best spot to start breeding. If you actually come too late, the best spots are gone, so it will have an uh, impact on your offspring. But it actually also, these animals can make a conscious decision. Well, maybe not this year. Breeding is not good for me. So they actually can make a conscious decision. So then going into the human cup, and I think everybody kind of knows about uh, seasonal influenza or human influenza and avian influenza and the kind of receptors they use. So they have what they call human receptors, so sialic acid 2.6 versus 2.3, the avian receptor. So it's kind of disnomer, because humans actually have the avian receptor, but not where normal seasonal influenza replicates, which is in the upper respiratory tract. So this part is very important uh, for both replication of seasonal influenza and also subsequent transmission. So if you go through the respiratory tract deep down, you could see the abundance of the receptor and the ability for the virus to bind there is decreasing. So it actually explains why seasonal influenza predominantly replicates in the upper the respiratory tract and doesn't normally cause severe disease. Whereas, for instance, highly pathogenic H5 and 1 doesn't really replicate in the upper respiratory tract, but goes deep down and causes uh, severe pneumonia. So I think influenza set the stage quite nicely. Moving to MERS, um, and Dr. Fauci already quite nicely introduced it, uh, was identified in a patient in Saudi Arabia in 2012. But the most interesting thing is actually in this phylogenetic tree, where it actually clustered in beta coronaviruses very closely to sequences obtained from bat coronaviruses. And another one, the notorious one, SARS coronaviruses, is in this group too. So it actually, for a lot of people, actually stopped ringing alarm bells, so this is kind of interesting virus, so we really need to see what's going on here. And then, of course, the, the South Korean uh, situation, where you had a lot of nosocomial transmission and super spreader event, which we also knew from SARS-CoV. So I think this is important to actually keep in your mind, that super spreader event in nosocomial settings, because that's going to be important. So although it was pointed out that this might be similar, this is actually what continuously is going on in Saudi Arabia as well. So it might not be that well known, but 
uh, around, I would say, the 80 to 90 percent of the cases get infected in the nosocomial setting. So the actual transmission from reservoir into the human population seems to be fairly minimal. So the first thing we did was kind of what we call uh, proving the Cox postulate, see where the, uh, the infectious agent they isolated in that first paper for the patients actually causes disease. So you have to adapt it a little bit. So the idea is you put that uh, virus, in this case, in a non-human primate model, and it needs to replicate the disease we see in humans, and you need to be able to re-isolate that virus. So what we nicely see here is that the virus causes lower respiratory tract infection, and you can see it replicating here in the lungs. So normally, the alveoli is where the gas exchange takes place, so it's a nice open space, type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes. So if it kind of looks like this, where everything is kind of like filled up with either edema or cells, influx of neutrophils, that's not good. Here, we actually are able to show the replication of the virus in the lower respiratory tract by immunohistochemistry and in situ hybridization. And then if you do co-staining with cytokeratin, you can actually see that this virus replicates in the type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes, which explains why this virus causes disease. So this is kind of important because this virus emerged in 2012, and up to now, there's no human pathology data of this virus, which is kind of understandable if you see where the virus originated from, which is the Middle East, and uh, post-mortems are not commonly done there. However, I would have expected due to the uh, South Korean outbreak, which was around May of last year, that this information would be available, but I've, I haven't seen it so far. So we're still relying on uh, non-human primate data. So getting a little bit toward that nosocomial setting, uh, which I think is interesting because, of course, in a, in a hospital setting, you have a whole uh, load of patients with all these kind of comorbidities. And I think that explains why this virus is so efficient in these kind of setting and not in the, in the normal population. And that's, I think, is kind of like not really well explained to the general audience that the general public is not really at risk for this particular virus. However, if you introduce it in a healthcare setting, that's where the problems arise. So what we did here, we actually treated non-human primates with a combination of cyclophosphamide and dexamethasone, which completely suppresses the immune system. And su not surprisingly, we see very high replication uh, in the lower respiratory tract in the lungs. So normally, if you, uh, if you see these kind of patients, in the beginning, they don't really shed that much virus. However, if they get more progressing in the disease, they start shedding more virus, which also explains why this virus is so easily transmitted in these healthcare settings. So getting back to the natural reservoir, so we did some experiments which show that the receptor for a variety of animals were actually able, the Mercy B was able to bind to the receptor of a variety of common livestock animals in the Middle East, such as dromedary camels. So we started out sampling uh, dromedary camels, and this is in Saudi Arabia, and we see, and these are, uh, this is serology, and we see a very high seroprevalence rate against this virus in dromedary camel, but not in any of the other species like horse, goat, and sheep. We also set up uh, surveillance in Jordan, and these are my uh, veterinary colleagues in, uh, in Erbit in Jordan from Just University. So this is not how you sample dromedary camel. <laughs> so what you kind of expect what happened here did happen. So this animal was definitely not happy and kicked. Uh, this is Saidun, it kicked Saidun. I was standing with a very impressive like, huh, I want to see how this plays out. What you're actually supposed to do, you need make them kneel down and then you sample them. So they're kind of they're kind of moody animals. Um, and this is a little bit about the dromedary camel. So it's been domesticated around 5,000 years ago. Oh, go back. This is the distribution. So all dromedary camels are domesticated. This is the normal distribution range. We see zero prevalence from Mali up to Kenya and Tanzania, Middle East, as far as in uh, Bangladesh. We have now information that also the dromedary camels in Bangladesh also are seropositive for Mercy UV. And then there's a large feral population who's actually seronegative in Australia. So 
a little bit background on camelids. They actually originate from the Americas. So we used to have uh, dromedary camels here. If you go to the Labrie tar pits in LA, you still see fossilized remains of dromedary camels. However, the dromedary camel or the camelids uh, crossed the Bering Street into uh, the old world. But of course, we still have the llamas, the alpacas, and the vicuñas, which are all camelids. So I wanted to know what you could actually, what, what the disease would look like in a dromedary camel. Um, so I had to explain Dr. Fauci that uh, the NIH was the proud owner of three dromedary camels. <laughs> I actually bought these dromedary camels from my startup budget. Uh, but this is something we cannot do. <laughs> Yeah, this is something we cannot do at the NIH. So I have, I have a collaboration with Colorado State University, who has a vet school, who has a large animal BSL-3 facility, where we did, so this is me and this is Dick Bowen, my collaborator, where we did an inoculation of three dromedary camels to kind of look what the disease would look like in these animals. And this is what it looked like. It's a common cold for a dromedary camel. That's all what happens. So they get an upper respiratory tract infection, nasal discharge. They don't get an elevation of temperature. They don't really get sick. They get moody because we swab them all the time. We take blood samples. They don't really like that. But if you look at the shedding, we see very high titus coming from the nose. Really kind of kind of explaining why this virus is very easy transmitted from dromedary camel to dromedary camel. And this is kind of similar to what we see with avian influenza versus seasonal influenza. In the dromedary camel, it replicates in the nasal cavity, but the deeper you get down in the respiratory tract, we don't see replication of MERS CV anymore. However, if you look at the rhesus macaque, it predominantly replicates deep down in the respiratory tract in the alveoli. So this is another thing like. At NIH, of course, we're very known, well known with the concept of vaccination of humans. So how about vaccination of dromedary camels to prevent zoonotic transmission? Which is kind of interesting because this virus is not a problem for a dromedary camel. So it's kind of like, we don't really know how it's going to play out. But we thought, let's start with a proof of principle first. Uh, together with Barney Graham of the VRC, we used one of their uh, vaccines, activated, we, uh, we vaccinated them. We had two groups, we had dromedary camels and we had alpacas. As I said, alpacas are also camelids, but then New World. And then uh, we challenged them. And what we actually saw, that it actually didn't particularly work well into camels. So these were the vaccinated camels and these were the unvaccinated controls. And you can see it doesn't really protect that well. We didn't really see any very good humoral response either. Uh, but these were all adult male dromedary camels. So we think there might be something that we need to work on to get a better humoral response. However, you look at the alpacas, it worked really well. So there's definitely opportunity to protect animals from an upper respiratory effect with MERS-CoV. However, we know, need to work a little bit more on uh, the correlates of immunity for immune protection for this particular virus. So I think this is where it comes together for mers v upper respiratory tract, very efficient uh, transmission from dromedary camel to a dromedary camel, relatively easy transmission from dromedary camel to humans, but inefficient transmission from human to human. But that's of course where it gets problematic because nothing is black and white, as I said, when you get in a nosocomial setting where you have people with these uh, comorbidities or uh, immune suppression, then the transmission seems to be actually very efficient. So it's not a black and white story. There are all these kind of different layers. I'll put this slide in just because it's pretty and also it marks like from MERS to Ebola. And the thing with Ebola is that I was, when I started working on Ebola, I kind of considered it as a niche virus, right? Like, as it was already said, we had around 23 outbreaks over the last four decades, but they're very small. Uh, the largest one before this was around 500 people. So we didn't really know, like, we, we kind of work with these kind of viruses where we think it's neat. We never expected that it would, like, explode as it did in West Africa. So my long-term research program uh, was about providing fundamental knowledge on the driver of Ebola virus outbreaks. I will not go into detail too much. 
But then, of course, when something like this happened, it's actually astonishing for a virus which was discovered in 1976, how little we know of very, very basic information. So we've seen this uh, before. There's a little bit different rendition from the one Dr. Fauci showed. But basically, with each and every arrow, you can put a question mark. We just don't really know. We just don't really know how it circulates in bats. We don't really know how it's transmitted either to non-human primates. So there's been large die-offs uh, in Western lowland gorillas in Gabon and Republic of Congo. Uh, there's been die-offs of diukers. You see a diuker over here. And this kind of nicely shows that there is an opportunity for relatively easy transmission. And uh, some of these outbreaks in Gabon and Republic of Congo has been really tied back to eating bushmeat and uh, the finding of dead gorillas succumb to uh, Ebola virus. So how does the work doing here, so this is with my technician, this Trent Bushmaker, and uh, this is Republic of Congo where we catch really big bats and we take samples and we follow this population longitudinally over time. And we, found, we haven't found the virus, but we find uh, seroprevalence of Ebola virus in these bats to this where we actually provide diagnostic support, which of course something you never hope to do. Uh, and this is in uh, Monrovia, and this is the setting we had. This is uh, Bob Fisher who's in my lab. I think the interesting thing is that everybody kind of has an opinion, and if you don't do your science too well, these opinions can be very problematic. So this is the first genome paper of uh, of Sierra Leonean derived sequences of Ebola. Uh, it's a gyre paper published in Science, and they observed an amino acid and a nucleotide substitution rate roughly twice as high in 2014. So when everybody's trained to think flu, everybody's trained to think, oh, if you have mutations, it adapts to humans, it becomes more transmissible, it becomes more pathogenic. It's already kind of interesting for something which already has a case fatality rate between 50 and 90% to become more, more pathogenic. And then you have like more people with, with opinions, uh, up at P's in New York Times by Michael Osterholm, really putting some oil on the discussion of potential airborne transmission of this virus. So why is this problematic? First of all, because there's no solid evidence that this is the case but it would put a really, really big dent in all the efforts people trying to do to stop that outbreak. If it would be, if that would be picked up, nobody would have been allowed to come back in the US, put in quarantine. They actually put all the military people in quarantine. Fortunately, we were not put in quarantine. But then, um, which I think it's, a, it's another success story of the NIH or the NIAID in this outbreak, is that we actually have very good collaboration in Mali with one of our ICERs and Mali, as shown by uh, Dr. Fauci, brought us nicely to Guinea, and they had an introduction of cases into Mali, but because we have a collab collaboration there, they were actually well prepared, and they also already had their uh, diagnostic running because we trained them. So they picked up the cases, these imported cases from Guinea, really fast, and they were able to quench that uh, introduction so it couldn't, uh, couldn't become an outbreak. So when we got those uh, isolates in, or we got those fire samples from these people in, and we sequenced them, we actually showed upon analysis that, uh, this is kind of the, the confidence interval, that it actually, if you go back and do your analysis, it actually has the same nucleotide uh, substitution rate as what's recorded with any previous outbreak, and this was the one from the Geyer outbreak, suggesting that there's no enhanced uh, nucleotide substitution rate and uh, that the worries about the doomsday situation by the virus becoming more transmissible by air is not really the case here. Of course, we don't really know, but there's no indication of an enhanced substitution rate. And then, of course, you need to understand transmission. So this virus is kind of, it's kind of nice, because again, it's not black and white. It has all these different layers. So it's very infectious, so you need very little virus to become infected, and it's very transmissible. However, because you have a relatively long incubation time, you can actually stop it quite easily, too, because it not only has a long incubation time, but the moment you get your febrile illness, you probably 
and we actually have data on that, you don't shed that much virus until you're in the end of your disease state. So that's when you're actually infectious. And these are the kind of common known uh, transmission routes, droplet transmission and predominantly body fluid contact. And I think this kind of shows it. This is the LWA3 facility where we provided diagnosis. This is run by MSF. And you can see there's only a very limited barrier between the site where the patients are and where we would be. And that's basically a tree foot area, a tree foot fence. So if it would be truly airborne transmissible, then it would, of course, not be sufficient. Uh, and of course, now we know that all the standard measurements of stopping an outbreak, like quarantine, contact tracing, were actually very efficacious in stopping this outbreak. So getting back to that data, which wasn't present at the start, one of the experiments I always wanted to do is um, basically if an animal dies of Ebola virus, which we do in the lab. So I, I took uh, non-human primates from vaccine study of Heinz, one of the SVSV vaccine studies, and I put them in an environmental chamber at conditions we observe in Liberia, and I would just sample them over time. So why is that relevant? Uh, one, of course, that you want to know how long is this virus infectious after that. And second is, we do a lot of um, body tracing. So if somebody dies, they pick up the body and they take a sample, and you need to know how well this procedure is. So that's because if that virus, or if that disease person is Ebola virus positive, then of course all the contact tracing needs to start. And what we actually nicely showed is two things Ebola virus stays uh, viable for around seven days in something which is decomposing. And secondly, if you take oral swabs, up to 10 weeks after that, you can still detect uh, Ebola virus RNA, which I thought was kind of surprising. So another thing which also points out on the public health uh, infrastructure in those kind of countries. So we have an Ebola outbreak at hand. So this is data from, uh, from Monrovia, from the LW2, where we both test for Ebola and malaria. And in yellow, we see Ebola, in green we see a combination between Ebola and malaria positive, and then in blue we see uh, malaria positive. So one thing is clear, we get uh, on triage a lot of people who just have malaria. So you cannot distinguish on triage whether a patient has Ebola or whether a patient has malaria. Not that surprising for me, but that means that you need to have very good diagnostic services because, <coughs> and we were able to provide a turner over time for under three hours from entry of a sample in our diagnostic facility to the results. Because of course, these people run the risk because they are in, uh, in a pre-phase where they're still in contact with potential people with Ebola, but you want to take them out. And secondly, you see that the burden of malaria is continuously high in Liberia throughout the year. I would expect that some kind of peaks there, but it just seems to be continuously high. Another interesting story is that resurface of, uh, of Ebola in, in Liberia, where we had a case uh, here on March 14 and March 13, that woman enters the Ebola treatment unit and eventually succumbed. And there was no uh, evidence of contact with anyone from uh, either Sierra Leone or Guinea, no attendance to funeral, uh, so it was kind of unclear how this person became infected, although we kind of uh, figured out that this person had sex with somebody who was a survivor and who was actually survived Ebola in September 2013. And uh, we managed to get a semen sample of this person who turned out to be positive. So now we have a nice kind of epidemiological kind of uh, scheme together where, where this suggests that this person became infected via sexual transmission, which has been documented before, and specifically with Marburg virus, which is kind of related. But for this outbreak, it was new. But to up that a level, and this is, this is great work by, uh, by colleagues of US Emirate. So we were, there was a lot of uh, government around, we were there, NEH, CDC was there, 
and US MRIT was there. And US MRIT was actually able to put a deep sequencer in Liberia, which is a ginormous effort. It took them three months to get it running, but they got it, got it running. And we got those samples, and we could nicely show that, yes, this person has a very high chance of being uh, infected by the sample of uh, that male survivor because it has the same amino acid uh, signature of this paper. So based on not only just classic epidemiology, but connecting that with molecular epidemiology, it kind of nicely proved this case. And then we followed it up with kind of classic experiments like how stable would Ebola be in semen? Uh, this is done in Rocky Mountain Labs. And it actually stays out uh, viable in semen for around uh, 20 days if you spike it with a relatively high dose. If you go in a more uh, realistic dose, which is around 10 to the third, it stays viable for around four days. But more importantly, we kind of show that the diagnostic procedures we used, so it's kind of interesting, right? Because it's all kind of amateur work. So we're all, these all kind of academics go to these labs, but none of these uh, assays we run are normally approved for the things we're running them, either whole blood, in this case, semen. So we kind of tested how well would, for instance, the RNA extraction and the subsequent PCR actually work on semen. Uh, so it works really well, but because it's a non-homogeneous fluid, uh, it's sometimes the, the standard deviation in what you get is a little bit higher. And I think this was mentioned by Tony well, and that's of course like how do we prepare for these kind of future outbreaks? Uh, and the WHO has this nice graphs of overall uh, health performance in ranking. And if you're in this part of the ranking, it's obviously not good. And I think this tells everything. Uh, 10 doctors per 100,000 people, one or less than 10, and that's obviously a huge problem, not only for Ebola, as I showed what the circulation and the incidence of malaria is, which of course like even a bigger killer, like by far a bigger killer than uh, Ebola. This really needs to be helped. So part of it that what we're doing, so I'm not training physicians, but I'm training a next generation of African scientists uh, trying to take up these kind of research questions I bring to them and hopefully uh, we have a good next generation of African scientists. This was actually uh, during a chikungunya outbreak in 2011. They didn't have any arbovirus uh, diagnostics running in this is Republic of Congo. So we implemented uh, arbovirus diagnostics and we, we showed that uh, the outbreak they had was actually caused by chikungunya. Uh, here we're training into the proper use of uh, flexible film isolators for dealing with Ebola samples. And I think this is something we should be focusing on more as a research community, really trying to reach out to those kind of countries, trying to train the next generation of scientists in those kind of countries. And this is my group in Rocky Mountain Labs. You can see I dressed down for the occasion a bit um, with my students. And I have a lot of collaborators uh, from Jordan to Republic of Congo, uh, specifically mentioned Colorado State, which without whom I wasn't able to do the dromedary camel work. And then, of course, all the guys and girls who, rate, who t rotated through uh, Moravia. And I'll be ready to address some questions. I have a question. Um, so when you were talking about the transmission of diseases um, from, you know, across species, I suppose, when you guys um, vaccinated the camels, was the goal to make sure that camels didn't spread amongst camels, or w would it be those camels that had that infection spreading to humans? Would it be the goal to make sure that those camels didn't transmit to humans? So it's actually both. So that's a good question. So one, of course, would be either complete sterile protection of reduction of shedding so you don't get the zoonotic transmission, so from dromedary camel to human. But of course, eventually, if you really want to be successful, you need to uh, stop the circulation of the vi virus amongst dromedary camel, whether that would be in specific farms, specific countries, or even a wider geographical range that still remains to be seen. But it's actually both of those two goals. Yeah. So, Victor, can you tell us <laughs> What is the difference in the molecular structure of Ebola restin in the monkeys here in restin versus Ebola zaire 
which was a human. Uh, yeah, so, so Ebola has five different species. Uh, and Restin is the only one which is not pathogenic in human, but interestingly, it is, it is actually highly pathogenic in non-human primates. Um, so there are sufficient differences to classify them as different species. Uh, based on molecular pathogenesis, we know what's very important, that's the same with MERS, UV, and SARS, that one of the ways these viruses are so pathogenic for humans is that they block the human innate response very strongly. So if you have uh, the molecular clones of Ebola and Restin, and you swap out the VP40, which is one of the proteins which really strongly blocks the interferon response, then uh, the Restin becomes pathogenic and the Zaire becomes less pathogenic. It's really suggesting that that's a very common mechanism to actually cause or either not cause disease into, uh, into the next host. So how many nucleotides is this sequence that's different? I mean, are we talking about uh, one or two I would, or No, no, I think or? that would be that would be in the 30, 40% range. Because otherwise it wouldn't classify as a, as a distinct species. Yeah, so they're both, uh, and there are also antigenic differences. So normally the idea is that if you would have a GP vaccine based against the air, it doesn't properly protect against Sudan or Bundibugyo. Yeah. So, Vincent, um, thank you. It was a great talk. Um, I'd like to ask you, uh, in this region, there's also a lot of Lhasa. <clears throat> and, um, you know, you looked at malaria and co-infections. Uh, will you or have you had an opportunity to look at Lhasa? And also, with the incidence of Lhasa in this region, are the staff now capable of maybe... Uh, looking at a diagnostic for Lhasa. Yeah, so the, the, the Lhasa incidence in that particular region seems to be low. So one of the reasons why we didn't implement it during the outbreak is because there was no way you could actually do something about it, which is kind of problematic, right? Like if, so if I test something positive for Lhasa, like MSF or uh, somebody else taking care of those patients need to do something about it. And we haven't done that, but we're definitely going to go. So if you go back to those non-malaria, non-Ebola samples, you probably can expect a whole range of different viruses, including Lhasa. I would expect predominantly arboviruses, uh, but we're going to go. We have like half of those samples at RML, and I'm probably going to reach out to CDC, who has the other half, to see uh, whether we can come up with some deep sequencing to see, to see what's circulating other than Ebola during that outbreak. Hi, I was wondering how the gain of function and select agent mandates have affected your research in recent years. Or um, so I stopped doing some stuff. Um, so I was I was very I'm very interested in some molecular mechanisms in how certain viruses would acquire pathogenicity, um, and for instance, swapping out different genes would. Would, it's not impossible, but it's just too much hassle. So I kind of, for now, stopped doing that. Also with MERS, it's, and MERS is not a select agent, but it's also, it's not really clear uh, where it's at. Um, but yes, it's a, it's, a major, it's a major potential hurdle. Yeah. What, what's the effect of global warming on the distribution of uh, many of these viruses, not so much the ones you've been talking about, but. I think, uh, I think like really, if you look at, the biggest impact would be vector-borne diseases, which we now already saw with the albopictus and the Egypti uh, crossbred of chikungunya. Chikungunya is a nice case example. Zika is a nice case example. Uh, Tick-borne encephalitis uh, seems to be cropping up. I would say SFTSV would be an important one. So I, I think, so the area, if you look at like Central Africa, doesn't seem to be too much affected by global warming. So I would more look at fringes where you would have like temperature rising like up and down. Uh, so you would see different distribution of vectors. And I think that's gonna have like, and we now already see that it has a big impact. Thinking about dengue, even yellow fever, chikungunya, I think it's gonna have a huge impact. Yeah. 
So if you combine that with our water policies in this country of draining, of not draining and of losing water and all the sort of thing, you might anticipate that we're going to see lots and lots of uh, yeah. uh, mosquito and uh, yeah. even well, I think like uh, like no? like you would expect already expect the mosquitoes are already here, right? Up up as far north as like New York, uh, elbow pictus. I don't know if there are any recorded cases of chikungunya, but I think that's something you can expect. Are there any other questions? Well, if not, thank you very, very much. Very exciting.